magnetic resonance to study the properties of nuclei, first of all, then, the, uh, then how molecules moved in liquids and solids and gases. And after a little while, something else was found out that the physicists uh, called one of the worst names they could think of. Uh, it was found that when you, for example, you wanted to measure the magnetic properties of the uh, uh, N14, the uh, isotope of nitrogen with seven protons and seven neutrons, that uh, if you put in a, something, uh, a chemical compound that the physicists randomly grabbed off the shelf, uh, they found not one signal, which would have been able to measure the magnetic properties of the nitrogen nucleus, but two. Uh, because there were two chemically different, two chemically different kinds of nitrogen in that uh, material. There was ammonium nitrate, and there was a tremendous uh, difference, two big peaks in the measurement, which immediately wiped out about four significant figures uh, from the measurement of the strength of the magnetic prop uh, properties of that nitrogen nucleus. And the, uh, so then it became evident that the physicists, in order to recover some of those significant figures, had to understand molecular electronic structure. As they called it, the chemical shift. Chemists took it up, proud of the name, and uh, began using it for chemical analysis. And that has developed into a uh, fantastically uh, you know, successful chapter in the application of basic physics uh, to chemistry and biochemistry, finding, looking at in great detail at the structures of molecules and mixtures and substances of various kinds. That's several other lectures. The, uh, but now let's get back, uh, but we're not going to go through all of that. Let's get back to the idea of the magnets in your body. Now, if, uh, uh, if they were uh, somewhat stronger, uh, you would have serious uh, problems that the nuclei uh, uh, were, were, were bigger and kept the same ratio of the, uh, the amount of uh, magnetic field they could generate uh, to their size. You would all be very magnetic. You would start clustering together, usually in strings. And, well, I come to think of it, lined up in rows. Like, uh, and, uh, uh, and you might all end up at the North or South Pole. Uh, this uh, uh, yeah, would have obviously changed the nature of evolution on Earth. Uh, however, uh, it was discovered some years ago that uh, even though human beings do not behave in this way, uh, bacteria exhibit a similar phenomenon. Not with the nuclei, but they deliberately secrete magnetic iron oxide crystals in themselves. And I'll point it out to you here so, so you, you can see that there's a little string of dots you'll see enlarged on the next overhead down there in this bacterium, and it deliberately does this not because it wants to know, which it does know, but it doesn't care, which direction north is. Here's a, a magnified string of these little particles inside the bacteria. They're magnetic iron oxide, Fe3O4. The reason it does it is that the magnetic lines of force, as you know, uh, in the northern hemisphere are pointing down as well as north. And so what they, these are bacteria that hate oxygen. And what they want to do is to go down. They're not big enough, heavy enough, so the gravity gives them much of a clue. But the magnetic forces between the magnetic iron oxide and the uh, magnetic field of the Earth enable them to go uh, down toward the bottom of the little mud ponds that they like to live in. Uh, uh, the, uh, Everett Purcell, one of the co-discoverers of magnetic resonance, also worked on uh, this problem of the magnetotactic bacteria. And he and others uh, were going to find out, before, as you want to, you know, a good physicist makes a prediction and then goes, check, goes to check and say, aha, if this is true, we go to the southern hemisphere, we will find that the bacteria uh, go south uh, in order to go down. And indeed, they, they found the southern hemisphere, the same species of bacterium, uh, uh, goes toward the south magnetic pole, uh, and, and uh, therefore goes down as the lines of force go that way. And you can flip them over, and they mutate magnetically from time to time, which is how you happen to have these two populations. The ones that mutate uh, to have the magnetic uh, uh, 
you know, uh, moments of the little iron oxide crystals the wrong way, uh, go up and get killed. So there's a very high, very strong selection mechanism against magnetic mutation uh, for these bacteria. But we don't have to worry about that. Uh, not in any magnetic fields that, uh, uh, that uh, people generate uh, at the present time. Uh, in a, on a neutron star, there would be another matter, but that's another lecture. Uh, okay. Uh, there will not be a quiz on this, so don't. Uh, right. but I, I just wanted to, uh, to see that this, this is all something that has now reached a, a high state of development in which one puts in pulses of radial frequency power and turns on little, little magnetic fields of various kinds in different patterns. All this is called sometimes uh, you know, spin engineering or spin gymnastics because of the spinning magnetic nuclei. And you detect an NMR signal here, nuclear magnetic resonance, that uh, can then be turned by mathematical operations uh, called Fourier transforms, which merely means picking out the different frequencies in here uh, into uh, a signal that tells you something about the molecules or the object that you're looking at. And I won't go into all of that unless there are questions. Uh, a bit of what looks something like science fiction down here. This is called by its inventors a spin warp imaging sequence. Uh, but it has nothing to do uh, with hyperspace, although, as you will see uh, later, it is possible uh, to get into the fourth dimension in this way. The, uh, okay, in order to focus on uh, one subclass of applications, I'm going to talk about the human brain. And uh, here is a brief introduction. Um, and uh, so my, yeah, we might be able to use a, a little less light and a little more focusing. Okay. There will be subsequent uh, things that will benefit as well. The, yeah, pardon? Well, although some of the things will go off the edge then, so. Uh, uh, there, uh, you know, they will not have to read all of these words and memorize them. So that, that, that can come when they go to medical school or uh, something like that. Uh, but these are magnetic resonance images of the human brain uh, made uh, uh, using the uh, signals from those little atomic nuclei, of, primarily of water, and making a slice through the center of the brain this way, or this way, or this way. The, uh, the color in there is to make it pretty for the pages of uh, the magazine, The Economist, uh, which had reasons for publishing this uh, a year or so ago. But you can see the various substructures in the brain and the cerebellum and the, and the uh, spinal cord coming down here. Uh, there are other things that you're all quite familiar with, even if you're not neuroanatomist. Nose, uh, uh, lips, uh, tongue, uh, etc. You can, eyes here, you can pretty much guess, ears. Uh, so, uh, at all levels, from the uh, from the profile that enables you to recognize your friends, uh, to the details of the inner structures that enable you to classify and judge the, the quality of their brains, all can come out of these, and all without, uh, so far as we know, uh, doing any uh, any harm. The structure uh, of the brain from a slice of brain. Uh, looks something like this. We'll give us an opportunity to introduce some nomenclature we'll come back to it in a bit. Uh, here is a surface of the cerebral cortex. The gray matter is this dark gray material here. The white matter is this lighter gray material in this anatomical section in here. Basically, the gray matter is the uh, electronic components and chemical and electronic that actually carry out the functions. The white matter is the wiring bubbles. Uh, and if you have an old, uh, an old uh, type electronic device, it's not made on a chip, but made from discrete components with lots and lots of colored wires. But this is all the colored wires connecting all of the individual spots around here where different things happen. So the brain is pretty literally wired up that way. And uh, one can look at details of that, not, not in uh, uh, you know, not not in uh, uh, only in slices of the brain uh, that have been uh, uh, obtained, of course, after the demise of its owner, 
No, but in other ways, brain imaging really began developing before 1930. Uh, people began looking with radioactive materials and x-rays uh, and uh, uh, gradually uh, came about the same time magnetic resonance imaging began to what you heard of as CT or CAT scanning, giving cross sections of, uh, of the brain with x-rays, uh, then uh, magnetic resonance imaging, and also at about the same time using the annihilation of positrons in the brain in order to uh, see where particular substances went. So, and they produce gamma rays that are, that are picked up uh, by a ring of crystals. So there are many methods of looking inside the brain. The highest resolution in uh, practical terms of the living brain is now uh, obtained uh, with magnetic resonance imaging techniques. Uh, and one of our collaborators out in uh, California, for example, here is the gray matter that you saw before, this, the white matter, you know, the connections inside, the skull, the scalp, and it is now possible to get down to small fractions of a millimeter uh, and to pick up uh, very detailed structures in the human brain. We are beginning to see structures that uh, have an uncertain meaning in the living brain. And uh, so that is an exciting kind of activity. The, uh, you can also do other things. These, this, the signals from the spinning nuclei give results in your machine, a big magnet and the radio components that depend upon whether they're sitting still or moving. And so you can separate out. Here's some work from a collaborator of ours uh, at the University of Chicago. And again, a career note, uh, uh, this uh, man, Dr. David Levin, started out getting a degree from Harvard as a theoretical physicist. He worked at that for a while, then went to medical school, and he is now both a physicist and a radiologist. And uh, when we collaborate, uh, he more often uh, does the heavy mathematics in our collaboration uh, than anything else because of his training as a physicist. But in this case, we have four frames from a video uh, showing some of the major blood vessels on the surface of the brain in red against the background in blue. Computer tricks, of course, are responsible for all the coloring in these pictures. There's no real color uh, in the, uh, the images of the brain uh, made by methods other than straight optical ones. And so one can see these. One can also see inside the brain, which I don't show here, uh, the fine tracery of tiny vessels uh, down to some millimeter size, uh, which show how the brain is nourished by the, uh, its blood supply. So uh, by making use of many different features of this, one can uh, uh, begin to do a, uh, a, a, people do a tremendous variety of things. Uh, this is also from a video. I did not have the time to make up a composite video from a large number of videos around. We're taking too much time to be swapping them in and out always. This is also from David Levin's laboratory. And what he does is, uh, along with some others, I'll make three-dimensional images of the head of the brain separated by mathematical methods from the surrounding head and the skull and, the skull and all. Uh, then what he can do is make a display that shows the neurosurgeon what he will find underneath. Uh, this isn't a terribly good reproduction on the transparency, but you can see the convolutions of the brain so that when the neurosurgeon goes in and cuts and takes out a piece of skull, uh, he has on the screen beside him a picture showing the brain, showing the place where he has cut, showing what he expects to find underneath. And then in this particular case, there's a pinkish cast here from a method of detecting tumors using radioactivity. This has been colored in to show uh, where this pinkish structure is that, he, that is the target of the procedure. So what is coming about now in many medical institutions is that the surgeons can preview an operation uh, and then follow what, uh, where they are going and what they are finding uh, you know, by comparing uh, their work with that on the screen showing these processed images. Uh, I have one tape that I wouldn't bring here to an unsuspecting audience that shows one of these actual operations in progress. Uh, and uh, you, you have to be a, uh, an experienced medical student or surgeon to watch it without flinching. The, uh, 
uh, or maybe an experienced viewer of public television. Right? <laughs> uh, the, uh, but uh, beyond this, people are even going beyond this now. The first experimental machine was delivered uh, just a month or so ago. Uh, that is be being uh, uh, used for surgical procedures in which the, the magnet is opened up so there's enough room for a surgeon uh, to get in and guide devices and then watch in real time as it pushes something in here, pushes something in there, clips something there, and so on. And these are the first steps being taken to have, in effect, the body transparent to the surgeon uh, when she goes in to do a particular operation. Uh, this, of course, is not always necessary, but there are times when you may not know uh, in advance enough about what you're going to find uh, and uh, so that the, uh, the ability to watch where you're going is, uh, uh, be very useful. First of all, there are methods of surgery now that use uh, little cuts and poke the devices in so you don't have to split you all the way down the front in order to go after something. Um, this is great because it means that there, there's a lot less trauma to the body. On the other hand, it means that the surgeon is feeling around a bit and uh, with little uh, microscopes on the tip of a fiber optic and things like that. Uh, the combination of being able to see things close up and see the context in which they are uh, is uh, going to make a number of surgical procedures uh, much less traumatic and safer and more effective. Beyond anatomy, however, and I mentioned before that one can do chemistry with nuclear magnetic resonance. The reason for that is that the exact radio frequency at which you see the spins flip over depends upon how strong the magnetic field is. It's like a, a top precessing. The stronger the gravitational field, the stronger it would precess. Put it up in a satellite and it won't be doing that anymore. So, uh, for example, if we uh, change the strength of the magnetic field by just about the amount of the strength of the Earth's magnetic field, the uh, resonant phenomenon that get, makes these signals uh, will take place about uh, two kilohertz uh, different uh, frequency out of maybe uh, 10 or 100 megahertz. This can be easily resolved with very good magnets. Of course, if you know about, you can make very uniform magnets, even more uniform than the ones you're trying to work with, so that you can see these little tiny differences uh, that might occur. You can get little differences inside molecules because the electrons uh, swirling around the nuclear framework slightly shield the individual nuclei from the external magnetic field. And they do it by numbers that are like a part in 10 to the 6th or a part in 10 to the 5th, to the, uh, so that parts per million of the, of the strength of the field that you apply. So that in different places in a, uh, in a molecule, uh, the protons or other nuclei see slightly different magnetic fields, hence they come out of slightly different radio frequencies. In effect, you tune, you tune for them through, in effect, through the dial of a radio, and you pick up a, a whole sequence of signals as if you were dialing along. The importance of that is that we would like to know the chemical composition, uh, how it changes in, uh, all over the body, but, but in this case, particularly in the brain, we would like to see how it changes when the brain functions, uh, when the brain is diseased, and so on. And hitherto, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, of measurement has been done by uh, other chemical methods. Uh, the, uh, we would prefer not to have to take the brain out uh, into a glass jar uh, in, or in order to carry out the chemical analysis uh, in, that we would like to do. In particular, the brain chemistry changes uh, when it is dumped into a jar of formalin or something like that. And we would much rather know how your brain chemistry changes when it is in you doing things that it has evolved to do. So that is the past. Uh, for the most part, although people still uh, you know, take brains and study, uh, study dead brains. Uh, but we hope to go beyond that. Here is an example of a nuclear magnetic resonance signal obtained on this campus uh, in something of a tour de force of studying uh, a living nervous tissue of an outpost of the brain. Your, the retina in the back of your eye is 
functionally and anatomically uh, an outpost of your brain, uh, connected by the optic nerve and the cells there uh, directly interact with the brain. And this is a single toad retina that is about the size of a dime that has been taken out and put into an apparatus that's actually in uh, uh, Burrell Hall here on campus uh, in a research program being carried out by Professor Joan Dawson. And looking at the phosphorus nuclei, and when you look at the phosphorus nuclei, some of you have had a, a bit of uh, biology, or maybe some know more biology than I do. Uh, the, here is uh, the nucleotide triphosphates, tip most of it, adenosine triphosphate, ATP, the energy currency of the cell, which has three phosphoruses, and these are signals, these are parts per million of the applied magnetic field or the frequency here, three phosphoruses for the different locations of, in that kind of molecule in the retina, another phosphorus compound uh, called phosphocreatin, phosphodiesters, uh, inorganic phosphate, the old familiar uh, PO4 triple minus ion, uh, slightly protonated usually at this pH, phosphomonoesters, uh, so on. There are other peaks in here that no one had previously detected using nuclear magnetic resonance. And experiments are going on in which light is shown on the retina, and the changes in the concentrations of particular phosphorus compounds studied while this is going on. And this is uh, contributing to our understanding of how this part of the nervous system functions. Uh, certain compounds, you put light on it, they go, they go down, and so on. Um, so that enables one to work out a theory of how the nerve cells in, there, the, in the optical system are uh, supplied with energy uh, by metabolism. So this is uh, just an example from some work on this, uh, on this campus of how the ability to look at chemistry uh, can begin to tell us things that otherwise would have required the removal of the brain. Uh, people have wanted to look at the brain for a long time. Uh, here is an example of a woodcut from back in the 17th century. And uh, this was uh, uh, an engraving showing what seems to be an advanced imaging device here with an advanced computer display type system, uh, kind of a virtual reality thing which projects the image up into the air above, uh, above there. And within it, you see all of the thoughts uh, the, the, uh, this chap is waving his hand to show he's really quite all right. Uh, the, uh, all of the thoughts uh, uh, from his brain, actually this, this is also an interventional device, and we have no way to think that any kind of present day imaging technology can go on to the stage where, as is described here, it can actually purge the naughty thoughts uh, from the brain. So have no fear. Uh, this part of the 17th century idea has yet to come anywhere near reality. Uh, but actually showing what they are, I'll show you that could be another matter. The, uh, this was uh, described by a, uh, people at a neurology institute up in Montreal, hence the funny spelling of center. Okay. The, uh, now, there has been a long argument dating back into antiquity um, Oh, time is wasted. How much more time do I really have? Okay. Uh, I guess I won't throw away this transparency. Uh, the, uh, dating back uh, into antiquity, uh, well, first of all, was the brain or the heart or something else the seat of thought and emotion? Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, and the answer is pretty clear that for, for, uh, for thought is the brain, emotion is it the mixture of the brain and the hormones coming from other glands and all of that. But, uh, but whether, it was, whether the, the thoughts and so on were distributed through the brain, in fact, uh, 10 or 20 years ago, there was a school that said they're distributed like a hologram, uh, not located in one particular spot or in another spot, but, but like a hologram where you might find a, find a representation of any thought anywhere in the brain. That uh, position has pretty much uh, been abandoned now. Uh, so here from one of the textbooks is a, an account of final, perhaps the longer and most important reason that it's taken so long to accept the doctrine of localization, meaning a particular kind of brain functions here, another there, and so on. 
is a proxy of our knowledge of the relationship of brain anatomy to behavior. The brain is immensely complex, and the structure of the function of many of its parts is still poorly understood. The excitement in neuroscience today lies in the conviction that the tools are at last in hand to explore the organ of the mind. And with that excitement comes the optimism that the biological basis of mental function will prove to be understandable. The, uh, for uh, centuries, uh, millennia, the information about what parts of the brain might do what came essentially from uh, dealing with, uh, from observing the behavior of people who had been in wars and other fights. Uh, if someone stuck a sword uh, into one part of your brain and your functions, behavior were affected in a particular way, later on in history, if they fired a bullet into your brain and the functions some particular way. Uh, later in history, if the surgeon's knife slipped uh, and your functions were affected in a particular way, there's information about uh, the, the localization of function. This is always suspect, of course. Uh, if, uh, if you fire a, a gun into the engine of a car and the wheels stop turning, uh, that doesn't tell you that the, uh, that the turning of the, of the wheels is directly controlled you know, by the fan belt. There's maybe a long, complex uh, chain of connections in there uh, that mean that damage in one place interferes in a complex way with functions elsewhere. But at least there were a lot of hints uh, that function was localized, but they were not strong enough hints uh, to convince everybody who thought they had philosophical or scientific reasons for believing otherwise. Uh, Eventually, with the use of radioactive isotopes, people began to uh, find out that you could uh, correlate changes in blood flow in the brain measured by the amount of radioactive isotope that would be deposited with certain things going on. This part of the brain that's involved with motor activities, muscles moving and so on, uh, if you move your finger like this, uh, they would find extra radioactivity here. Uh, if you, just a simple mindless thing, sort of. If you have to move your finger in a complex way, you are told, pretend you are playing a, a, uh, uh, something from Mozart, or, uh, or, follow, or, work, or work out a sequence, which is you tap it, uh, all the odd numbers up to, to nine and back again. You have to keep thinking about programming another area line. If you just pretend that you're, re you're rehearsing for this procedure, but you don't actually move your finger, only the spot lights up. So people began to be able, uh, a decade or so ago, to start uh, separating out uh, some components of brain function. And uh, so that a, uh, a fairly representative view of what goes on in your brain is now what is shown here. You're doing any particular thing, but there are focal spots that light up representing populations of nerve cells, neurons, that are doing something that they aren't doing uh, when you're just uh, just sitting there uh, with your mind more or less turned off, like probably some in the back of the room are right now. Uh, the, uh, in the future, I hope a lecturer will have available a little screen that will Make it possible to tell who's turned off. Okay. Um, of course, you've all listened to some lecture. Pardon? I hope not. Yeah, of course. <laughs> It'll keep them alert. Okay. Uh, of course, you've all heard lecturers speak in a way that suggests uh, that their brain is not particularly active, but it's just a, there's an automatically programmed uh, sort of uh, function going on. The tongue is wagging with very little connection to anything else. Um, the uh, so it works for The um, Also, from the uh, major scientific uh, publication, The Economist, uh, some examples from recent studies with radioactivity showing the, the structure of the brain, uh, visual centers under different circumstances. Uh, if you're recalling words from long-term memory, some of these purple re regions light up. If you're uh, and red and yellow regions down in a special part of the brain. Language functions using radioactive isotopes can be picked up uh, with things happening here and there in the brain. And uh, during speech up here, 
or listening to speech down here, different parts of your brain are involved. Different neurons are busy working and uh, sending out signals here and there. So uh, my brain is working differently from your brain right now. Different parts, if we were watching them, uh, different subsections would be lit up, since presumably I'm only lec lecturing and not listening to what I say. Um, Uh, again, this, is not, this will not be on the quiz, but uh, you can measure chemical shifts inside images by more of these things are just manipulating the pulses of radio frequency power and little magnetic coils detecting signals uh, in this way uh, so that you can pick out what is going on chemically in different parts of the brain. I promised you hyperspace. Uh, here is uh, a, a three-dimensional imaging. Here is a four-dimensional chemical shift imaging sequence, which we pick out three spatial dimensions. And then the signals here actually represent what is mathematically behaves exactly like a fourth dimension. Things can be plotted in the computer in four-dimensional space. And one can look for uh, where are using as one of the pseudo-spatial axes is actually represented by our frequency, the different peaks lined up at different frequencies in the NMR signal. The spatial locations also come out as different frequencies. So we can have four sets of frequencies, which can be assigned to four axes in a four-dimensional space. And then you can ask, at this position in, in uh, real spatial space, what kind of uh, of signals or what molecules do you find, or you can ask for a particular location, what a particular one of these peaks in the chemical uh, space, spectroscopy space, uh, where is that located in the second spatial dimension. So you can uh, work in actually in four dimensions. Uh, for this, is, uh, this is not Einstein's uh, time dimension. This is uh, a what it usually appears only in uh, in, in uh, more uh, advanced and uh, uh, controversial uh, theories of how the physical universe is organized, but as a practical tool uh, in doing these studies, just the mathematics of four dimensions. Uh, this, uh, this is an example of taking an image. This, in fact, is Professor Joan Dawson on this campus, who uh, works on in vivo spectroscopy and was using her own head as our standard head here. And by special tricks, which I won't try to describe to you, I've tried and failed sometimes with professional audiences, but we can pick out all of the phosphorus nuclear magnetic resonance signals from this part of the brain. Um, They're represented here, normalized to a particular scale and separately from this part of the brain represented here and pick up differences in the chemical composition of the different parts uh, of the brain in this way. We can also pick out differences between white and gray matter and so on. So that uh, one in various ways can connect chemistry with anatomy uh, by using these methods, again, uh, uh, without uh, any dangerous or invasive procedures, which uh, this is shown by the fact that typically in these studies, the, uh, the person doing the study offers him or herself uh, as a first example uh, to be used. Uh, in particular, you, know, you can mess up these signals by moving and so on. Uh, the person who was the principal investigator on the grant and the uh, lead author on the paper has a very strong uh, incentive to lie still so that it will actually work, even more so than a graduate student. So, so what, what people want to do, or working toward actually accomplishing in some cases, is to look, here's a, just a diagram of the ribbon of gray matter, which is a three-dimensional sheet, actually. And one can pick out, pick out regions that are connected with movement, uh, with uh, you know, sensory uh, activities, such as uh, feeling something on your skin, uh, lower brain nuclei involved in more complex things, the visual area that is connected directly to the eyes up here, and lights up immediately. All of these things uh, one can begin to study and, uh, and are now uh, being studied. The uh, people have, for example, found changes in the 
concentration of lactic acid uh, by using spectroscopy uh, in this primary visual area here uh, that accompany visual stimulus. And there are aspects of the metabolism, the physiology we do not yet understand. We don't know why the lactic acid appears at that point, uh, to what particular, to the particular concentration we can measure about uh, up to about one millimolar, uh, and then and then over a period of minutes the concentration goes away, then it dies down again, even while the stimulus still goes on. So there are transient chemical adjustments that are made in the brain that we do not yet understand. Even more strikingly, uh, starting a few years ago, people began finding nuclear magnetic re resonance ways to determine how blood flow was changing in the brain. Remember I said that when the, the blood flow changes around the neurons, if you put in radioisotopes, you can tell by how much it was extracted out of the flowing blood. But it turns out that there are ways in which, first of all, you can inject magnetic materials, magnetic molecules, for example, uh, complex gadolinium into the uh, body uh, and watch its passage through the brain. And here in this case, uh, some work from Massachusetts General Hospital uh, from several years ago, in which you have a, uh, a view of the part of the brain that was being looked at. The primary visual region is back here, a close-up sort of here where the orange regions are the regions of activity superimposed on the blue anatomical structure of the brain. And this is a region where, in general, uh, one expects from other studies to find the first activation of the brain with a visual signal. In this case, there were flashing red lights that were being used for the stimulus in a very simple way. So things go on uh, that one can pick up. It turns out, by the way, that uh, our brains are all different. The, uh, uh, this has been... Uh, known in some respects for a long time that the, for example, the visual region uh, in your brain uh, may, uh, may be three times larger than in his brain uh, for no known reason. Uh, how much is genetics? How much is development? How much is even use? We're now learning that the parts of the brain, uh, if you move this finger uh, a lot, eventually uh, don't move this one. Uh, that the region in the brain that represents the movement of this finger will expand at the expense of the one next to it. Uh, your brain actually adjusts in a way, well, your muscles adjust to use, uh, and uh, you know you get all muscle-bound pumping iron, and you're, then you're not very good at, uh, at tennis anymore, for example. Uh, maybe the same sort of thing happens in our brains. They certainly adjust, so one part develops at the expense of another. And uh, that is one of the more exciting frontiers at the present time. Uh, some work that was done in collaboration with our friends at, uh, at the University of Chicago, also by people working at the Beckman Institute in Cognitive Neuroscience, using a flashing checkerboard, only, we see only one dimension of the checkerboard here, uh, and then looking at the uh, at seven and a half times a second, and looking at the functional uh, region of the brain uh, from a, uh, a graduate student who uh, went up to Chicago with a group in, in order to uh, present his brain uh, for the study. Uh, can you guys see this sort of thing happening in here? And uh, so the detailed psychological studies, how do you respond to this when, when this is happening and vice versa and so on, are possible underway in other centers and in here as well. The, okay, I brought you up more or less to the present. Uh, now I'm going to speculate a little bit. Uh, but I will uh, present, before I do that, I will bring, I will present you with a cautionary statement. Uh, I'm going to be making some guesses about the way things will develop. And we have here a kind of a, of a uh, I don't know whether it's a backhand compliment or a complicated uh, uh, you know, uh, insult or exactly what. Uh, so you'll have to decide, presumably in the future, whether some of these guesses were inept or not. First of all, with the further development of these techniques, we're looking at the possibility of significantly increasing uh, resolution so that we can see down almost to the level of individual cells in the brain. Not quite. But the brain is organized in little groups of cells 
that are typically a fraction of a millimeter across. The layers in the gray matter, uh, little clumps here and there that uh, what are called collet. Your brain tends to be organized uh, and uh, little regions, uh, a few tenths of a millimeter to a millimeter apart, perpendicular to your gray matter that go in uh, and where the cells work together. Uh, so these are just coming in within range. Uh, now one of my students here has shown that it should be possible to get down to well below a tenth of a millimeter if we can keep the brain quiet enough. Uh, what kind of, thing, kind of things can we expect to see? This is not a nuclear magnetic resonance image. It is better than anything we can do now on a rat brain, uh, but it was uh, carried out, uh, a study carried out by injecting a, uh, a rat with a material that would show up strongly in an ordinary x-ray film here after slicing the brain. Uh, the late Bill Ollendorf, California, uh, who incidentally sort of invented uh, cat scanning with x-rays uh, and, uh, but didn't show the Nobel Prize for it. There are many such tales in the, uh, uh, the uh, stories of science. But here you, you see the material, barium sulfate actually has gone into the tiny veins and arteries. You can see the richness of the vasculature here, uh, that coming through the surface of the brain. These are called radial arteries for obvious reasons. Uh, so that there's a tremendous amount of detailed structure uh, that relates uh, the vascular system in the brain uh, to function. And for example, one of the uh, specialties of a very famous neuroscientist on this campus, uh, Bill Greeno, is looking at rats to see how the blood vessels, new blood vessels grow, how blood vessels change with experience in rats. It turns out that if you have baby rats that grow up and are Pride environment, uh, uh, like the things you read about in the newspapers where somebody keeps the kids in a bare room or something like that. Their brains don't develop uh, uh, as well as do rats who have lots of good toys. Uh, so he's been studying this sort of thing for years, the changes in the nerve cells and the circulation, and even some studies that we're collaborating with him on at the present time. It turns out that the richness of the, of the blood vessels and the blood volume uh, can depend upon whether the rats are couch potatoes or have been doing a lot of jogging. Uh, and uh, this, of course, is a very important as a model for, you know, if you want to be, uh, if you want to be a bright old, uh, old codger, uh, that, uh, you know, maybe you should do a lot of exercise to keep your brain well nourished as well as your muscles and so on. Your knees may break down, but you'll have to make that choice. Uh, the, um, another thing there, from the wish list of neuroscience, if only the brain were semi-transparent, with pathways that lit up when they were in use, we might more easily relate structure with mind. Uh, true. Uh, one of my graduate students is trying to confirm an observation uh, made recently in Tokyo that those, that the white matter, the wires, in effect, that connect the different parts of the brain, uh, which are nerve axons, uh, formally, uh, that, uh, Something that I'll, I'll speak here, probably over the heads of most most of you, to the uh, but to the physicists, uh, that the diffusion of the water molecule. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll I'll bring it down to where uh, everybody, uh, even me, can understand. The diffusion of the molecules inside this fibrous white matter uh, goes more rapidly uh, along these tracks than perpendicular to them, and you can measure this also by nuclear magnetic resonance what's called an anisotropic diffusion coefficient. And how much this difference there is appears, we don't know yet for sure, to depend upon whether those uh, nerve wires are connecting a region that is actively functioning to another region to which it is passing information. And it may be, we, it is known from other studies, that the molecules inside the nerve axons reorganize themselves when they're transmitting signals uh, I'll let this observation you know, may be wrong, uh, but on the other hand, if it's right, it may be that, uh, that this change occurred because of this kind of reorganization uh, along there. So this, I say, this is uh, beyond the bounds of uh, what is known now, but uh, since what is known now will be ancient history by the time you're professionals, I should have a little try at moving out ahead. Another thing 
uh, we'll get back to, to uh, the magnetic particles. The magnetotactic bacteria have been known for a long time. Now, seems like a long time, uh, 15 years. The, uh, it is also known that the same kind of magnetic particles are found in many, many organisms uh, uh, throughout the whole animal kingdom, including people, and including people's brains. And people have speculated about what are they doing there. Are they merely uh, waste dumps for extra iron in the body, but in a relatively innocuous form, or are they functional? People have suggested that these uh, magnetic crystals may be involved in sensing magnetic fields in some animals. Uh, you can get into heavy controversy over whether that might be true or not. And uh, so the, the, their functions are still quite unknown. As in so many other areas, we may have to call upon Arthur Clarke uh, to suggest a solution uh, to this. Uh, in uh, Beyond the Fall of Night, it says, uh, uh, left out some of the irrelevant details, only we have the threads of microwave active magnetite laid down in skull and brain. They twine among your and our neurological circuitry. When stimulated by electrical activity, these amplify and transmit our thoughts. Now, whether these magnetite crystals, such as they occur in bacteria, actually give us some potential for telepathy, I leave to your generation uh, to understand, or possibly to write science fiction about. It. Thank you. There are no, um, uh, to my knowledge, no authenticated examples of hallucinations or anything like that. What you can have in a strong magnetic field, whether it's a magnetic resonance imaging machine or, or going out to the field around a particle detector, is something called a magnetophosphine, in which you get little uh, impressions of flashing lights that have their origin in the retina. Closing your eyes and pressing your thumb on the eyeball a bit can also produce the same kind of response. Uh, no, no one has ever found any evidence that these are anything more than transient uh, phenomena that, uh, that have no hazard associated with them. Uh, a lot of people have been in very high magnetic fields long before we were doing nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, uh, particularly uh, around particle accelerators. Uh, and uh, uh, so that the, uh, there are a variety of anecdotal studies, uh, or anecdotal accounts of uh, magnetic field effects, uh, as well as electric fields and so on. The, uh, uh, so far as I know, all have been impossible to uh, reproduce in well-controlled studies. Uh, they, uh, uh, now there was, uh, if you expect something to happen, the human brain is a wonderful filter for picking out uh, subtle phenomena in the environment, whether they're there or not. And uh, for example, I have a colleague who uh, was going to turn on a new magnet for NMR studies uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a chemistry building at a university. Uh, we all announced it was supposed to be energized uh, uh, on a particular day. The next day, people came streaming down to his office, screaming about the fact that their microbalances weren't, weren't working, their computers had messed up, uh, all sorts of, they were getting headaches. Uh, so, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, the uh, manufacturer's rep didn't arrive yesterday. It won't be turned on until today. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, there is a well-known phenomenon, and when something is, a, is, a, is borderline, uh, it is very difficult to separate uh, fact from fancy. And people keep trying to see whether there's anything, uh, anything real in the magnetic field, electric field hazards. Uh, but the problem is that these signals tend to get lost in that kind of noise. So, but millions of people have gone through the uh, the uh, clinical machines. Detailed studies have been done with very high magnetic field machines, such as one that we're uh, have been uh, you know, trying to put together here in the Beckman Institute. Uh, 
right now that uh, that magnet uh, uh, damaged itself during testing, and we aren't sure uh, uh, when or if it will uh, it will get repaired here. We may send it out. Uh, so there's not, not a great deal to see there, uh, unless just to uh, see a sick magnet, uh, but it's not on. Uh, but many of the very high magnetic fields like that, uh, again, the, there's been natural concern on the part of the Food and Drug Administration and others, uh, and there have been extensive studies, people have been looking for any effects, and uh, occasionally people get, a, if they move their heads in the magnetic field, they get a slight uh, uh, you know, dizzy feeling like motion sickness. And there's some people who say there's a correlation between uh, the tendency to get car sick or uh, seasick and the tendency, if you move your head a little bit, to, uh, uh, to have a little bit of the same feeling. This may have something to do with activation of the hair cells in the ear. Uh, the, uh, uh, if you've got a funny taste in your mouth, especially if you have a lot of fillings and dental appliances, uh, and this has to do with, uh, with uh, electrical phenomena occurring uh, between the uh, 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 you know, between the uh, tissue and the metal. Uh, and again, uh, this has been known for about as long as people have been making strong magnets. And uh, again, no one has ever found any permanent or, uh, or hazardous uh, consequences of this kind of thing. So the, the general uh, feeling right now is that uh, also animals have routinely been subjected to detailed physiological studies, magnetic resonance spectroscopy and, and imaging uh, and so on, but much higher magnetic fields than any human is exposed to uh, in uh, laboratories. And the detailed studies of that sort that have been done, uh, again, no one has been able to isolate any effect that seems to result from a change in metabolism or subsequent changes in the animal. So uh, everyone remains alert, but at the moment, uh, uh, things uh, look safe. Safer than x-rays, for instance. Uh, probably not, although that's still quite controversial. Uh, there was a group in the Beckman Institute here under a biophysicist named Carl Schulten, uh, who has been studying other ways in which the magnetic field uh, might be detectable you know, by birds. Uh, uh, there have been studies of bees, as well as birds, studies of uh, dolphins, uh, that have the magnetic particles. Uh, there seems to be some correlation with their presence and uh, the uh, and the attendance of the animals to have to go long distances uh, and find out where they are. Uh, whether this is just because people have looked more in this kind of animal and paid more attention, or whether it's a real connection, I don't think anyone knows yet. Uh, it's a very if it is a, something that's very subtle uh, to, to try to very difficult to find out how to do perfectly controlled experiment. You can't take the magnetic particles out of it. Uh, they're embedded in the, in the brain and bone and things like that. So it's difficult to know uh, where we stand there. I wish I did. Uh, uh, we don't yet know what that is. There seem, uh, there's some evidence from, uh, at least in uh, some parts of the brain, the, the motion of the intact brain is down at the, uh, is down below the few tenths of a millimeter level. Uh, if you take off a part of the skull, you're a neurosurgeon, the brain is pulsating in there because the, the cap is off the top. And uh, so it uh, the brain does pulsate from uh, the arterial pulsations, but uh, and there there are conflicting stories about exactly how much and what part of the brain. Uh, we my best guess from the data that I've seen is that it's down in the uh, uh, in the tenths of a millimeter range if you do things right. It's hard to hold people still. Uh, there are of course the pos uh, possibilities using advanced image processing methods of the sort that are used to remove motion effects from uh, satellite uh, photos and, uh, uh, and blurring uh, from other, uh, other kinds of images and pictures uh, in which one can, uh, can uh, 
stop uh, motion in effect and re-register images of things that have moved. People use those methods for the heart and the lungs, for example, where if the patient is still of interest to a doctor, uh, basically these things are moving. And uh, so uh, people have long since learned how to, uh, how to, for example, to synchronize imaging of the heart with, the beat, uh, with its beating so that you can pick it out in a particular phase. That's also done for some of the brain imaging studies. Uh, what other motions there are, uh, we have uh, uh, one, uh, there are two people here who um, I'm associated with. Uh, uh, one is in uh, electric computer engineering, and uh, one is a physicist getting his MD degree here. We're looking at new methods for uh, measuring and compensating for motion. And what we particularly are focusing on is a question we're getting down to very high resolution small parts of the brain. Uh, how can one uh, detect the motion and compensate for it? So back and forth motion. Probably we think most of it is to a high degree of approximation of simple back and forth motion uh, at any given single point in the brain and not a more complicated kind of trajectory. But that also remains to be seen. So the plenty of Plenty of room for applied mathematicians as well as biologists and all of that here. We can certainly come up afterward. Why not? But otherwise, I think it's Suggest to you, but no to me. <laughs> That's all you're in charge. I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> well, uh, there was. Uh, I didn't want to make a big thing. Looks yeah. like everybody wants to have a question. <laughs> <laughs> we'll turn this off so we don't get a headshot of you, right? <laughs> 